I'm not actually going to tell you about Hempel's ravens. I'm going to tell you about a very similar story involving Aisha and the traffic lights. I think this is better. Um, so here's an argument. I've never seen Aisha stop for a red light. Therefore, Aisha will not stop for this red light. Now, I think this is a pretty sound piece of everyday inductive reasoning. Sometimes we're forced to rely on statistical evidence because we don't have very deep insight. There's no possibility of a more strongly abductive argument. And so we do this. I think this is good. But what we need in order to discuss the problem that Hempel introduced with his ravens, I'm doing it with traffic lights, uh, is a different argument, one with a general conclusion. So you see, this is a, an argument with a particular conclusion. It's about a particular event. I think this is fairly clearly a good piece of inductive reasoning. It's a little bit less clear that if we have a general conclusion, um, we've got such a good piece of inductive reasoning and that this is really how we want to use these sort of narrowly statistical forms of inductive reasoning. But nevertheless, I think we might be, I think we might be okay here. So what we need to do is to focus on inductive arguments with general conclusions here. And in fact, I'm just going to focus on the conclusion. Aisha will not stop for any red light. And I'm going to ask you, which observations count as evidence for this conclusion? What would you, what could you observe that would count as evidence that Aisha will not stop for any red light? Here's a candidate answer. A candidate answer is this. Um, those observations where the light is red and Aisha does not stop are the observations which count as evidence for Aisha will not stop for any red light. Nice idea, very simple. And I guess you can already see roughly how to generalize that idea. So it's quite attractive to us. Um, in general, we might say an observation of an F which is G is evidence for the conclusion, the generalization that all Fs are Gs. That all red lights are such that Aisha will not stop for them. Very simple. Uh, so attractive for its simplicity and therefore worth considering carefully. Uh, so here's the claim again. An observation of an instance is evidence for the generalization. By an instance, I mean a particular observation, a, an observation of a particular situation. So the light is red and Aisha does not stop. That's an observation of an instance. Uh, by generalization, I mean a claim like Aisha will not stop for any red light. So here's a general claim that is true only because lots and lots and lots of different unspecified instances have the feature in question. So there's a generalization. Very good. Second thought is that any evidence that confirms a generalization will also confirm a logically equivalent generalization. So if we can confirm a generalization and then we've got a logically equivalent one that we can reach via a piece of deductive reasoning, it would seem that we've also confirmed that one. So we can tidy up our theory by putting these two principles together. Now, let me stop here for a moment to explain this notion, though, of logical equivalence. Well, not really to explain it, to state what it means. What does it mean to say that two generalizations are logically equivalent? Well, it means this. It means that there's no possible situation in which one is true and the other is false. Two generalizations are logically equivalent if there's no possible situation in which one is true and the other is false. So given that understanding of logical equivalence, you can kind of see why if you're confirming a generalization, then it seems you're kind of confirming everything that's logically equivalent to it, because there's no possibility that the thing that's logically equivalent to it could be false, even though the generalization you have confirmed is true. So this principle too seems like a fairly sound principle there. But these two principles together, interestingly, get us into some super hot water. And this was exactly the problem that Hempel noticed and illustrated with his ravens. Uh, so here's two generalizations. Aisha will not stop for any red light. And two, anything Aisha will stop for is not a red light. Turns out that these two generalizations are logically equivalent. There's no possible situation where the first generalization is true and the second false, nor conversely. You may be able to see that already. And there's various ways to try to see it. Um, and that's something that we shouldn't worry about too much for this course. You can take my word for it. But if we wanted to reason it through, we might go like this. Suppose that the first generalization is true. 
right? And now suppose that Aisha stopped for something. Well, we know that what she stopped for can't be a red light because the first generalization tells us that she won't stop for a red light. So we know that if she stopped, whatever she stopped for isn't a red light. So we know that the second generalization is true. Now let's go the other way around. So let's start with the second generalization. We suppose we know that anything Aisha will stop for is not a red light. Now suppose that she doesn't stop. Uh, sorry, now suppose that we have a red light. Will Aisha stop? Absolutely not, because we know that, that if she is going to stop, it won't be for a red light. So if we've got a red light, we know from the second generalization that she's not going to stop. And so we know that the first generalization is true. So these two generalizations are logically equivalent. There's no possible situation in which one is true and the other is false. They're actually just reformulations of a single idea, I would say. Uh, <clears throat> good. Now here's an observation. Aisha stops for a pedestrian to cross. So I would say that's an instance of this second generalization. Aisha stopping for a pedestrian to cross is an instance of that second generalization. And indeed, there are lots of instances of this second generalization. When Aisha stops for an ambulance to overtake her, she thoughtfully pulls aside and stops. That's also an instance of generalization two. Aisha, anything Aisha will stop for is not a red light. Here she is, she's stopping and the ambulance is not a red light. Uh, so we could carry on with these observations. But here's the thing. We were just saying <laughs> that any instance of a generalization counts as evidence for that generalization, but also as evidence for anything logically equivalent to it. So that tells us that any observation which is evidence for generalization two, these things, is also evidence for generalization one. But now it seems like we're really in trouble here because if I've never seen Aisha stop for a red light, I can pretty reasonably infer that she won't stop for any red light. I, I struggle a bit with this, but OK, I mean, I don't think that's terrible. By contrast, this is really terrible. This is an uncontroversially terrible piece of inductive reasoning. I've often seen Aisha stop for things other than red lights. Therefore, Aisha will not stop for any red light. That really shouldn't seem convincing to you. That really shouldn't seem convincing to you. It turns out humans generally, me included, are pretty terrible at reasoning. Um, take a moment. If this seems good to you, something's gone wrong, have a, have a keep thinking about it. You'll get there eventually. You'll get there eventually. Although we're pretty terrible about reasoning, at reasoning, we can do it if we go slowly enough. We can do it if we go slowly enough. Interesting discoveries, but that's psychology, Steve. Focus here. So where are we? Um, we're about to find ourselves with uh, a set of inconsistent claims. Um, so these two claims are consistent, but they take us to a pretty funny place. So let's add a third claim here. And we've got one of my favorite things of all time, almost as good as bar of chocolate. We've got an inconsistent triad. We've got an inconsistent triad. So if you're thinking about giving me a little present, um, chocolate is the best thing. But if you can't give me chocolate, then an inconsistent triad is the next best thing you can give me. Here's one that I quite like. I'm quite fond of this one. Um, so any observation of an instance is evidence for the generalization. Any evidence that confirms a generalization also confirms any logically equivalent generalization. And finally, that argument we just saw, I've often seen Aisha stop for things other than red lights, therefore Aisha will not stop for any red light, is a bad argument. Here's the thing, we can't have all three. We have to reject at least one of these claims. So what are we going to reject? Are we going to reject the first claim? That would be sad because that gives us a very nice, simple account of the relation between observations and generalizations where the observation is evidence for the generalization. Are we going to reject the second claim? Hmm, pretty difficult to do. Or are we going to reject the third claim and try to tell ourselves that somehow, you know, this is a good argument? I'm not sure. So let me give you a moment here. Um, take a 90 seconds with your lecture buddy or buddies, uh, which of these three claims should be rejected? Which of these three claims should be rejected? I hope that in 90 seconds or perhaps much less, you can reach consensus on this. Go.
So here's the line that I'm going to take. I think it's likely to be what you've reached as well. And unusually, I think this is probably right. I'm really pretty confident that there's not much wrong with this. I want to say that the third claim is true. We can't reject this. Uh, this is a genuinely bad argument. It's an appalling piece of reasoning. And any attempt to pretend otherwise is really a move of desperation that could only be motivated by wanting to hold on to a theoretical claim. And that's always bad. That's always bad. Um, you, you, you will see that a lot in philosophy. Philosophers will tell you all kinds of crazy things are true because they really want to hold on to some particular piece of theory. Um, never a good way to reason. Um, the second claim, I think, is also very, very hard to mess with. Again, you will see that philosophers mess with this kind of claim. Um, but think about it for a second. We do a piece of inductive reasoning, we arrive at a generalization. We then know that a further generalization is logically equivalent to that one. But somehow we're supposed to say that the evidence that we used in the first piece of inductive reasoning doesn't support that second conclusion. Yeah, I mean, no nothing certain, nothing certain. It's possible, but yeah, it's a real move of desperation. You know, if your theory takes you there, why are you still holding on to that theory? If that's what your theory commits you to, you're so confident in the theory that you can reject this? I doubt it. I really doubt it. So that leaves the first claim here. And really the first claim, the attraction of the first claim for us is that it provides us with a nice simple account, but we haven't got any other interesting reason to think it's true. So this claim here, I think, is clearly the least well supported of the inconsistent triad. And since you and I, we're not yet in the grip of a theory, we should do what that suggests we should reject the least well supported of these three claims and see where it gets us to. So that's kind of interesting discovery for us because our question, what's the relation between the premises of an inductive or inductive argument and its conclusion? It looked for a minute there that we were going to come up with a beautifully simple and very elegant answer, Hempel's answer. Um, it's really a matter of the observation or the premises being an instance of the generalization, which is the conclusion, or else an instance of a logically equivalent generalization. And that would have been a beautiful answer. It looks like we can't have that answer. It looks like we can't have that answer. That's what Hempel's ravens have shown us.